Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance. We are calling the meeting of the Rutherford County Benefits and Insurance Committee to order. And the first item on the agenda is to approve the minutes of the last meeting. Do we have a motion? Mr. Hafner and Ms. Hickerson and others have seconded that. Anyone have any corrections or additions? If not, everyone in favor of that, please say aye. Okay, thank you. That was weak. <laughs> oh. Let's see. Do we have anybody here that wasn't here at the last meeting? I mean, uh, now, Ms. Let's see. What's your official title, Ms. Acton? Chief Deputy Preble Acton, who is the Chief Administrative Officer for the uh, Sheriff's Office, is here with us. So welcome. Thank you for your participation. Okay. All right, next, Ms. Street Financial Reports. Yes, I'd like to also introduce Ms. Christy Allen to the committee. She'll be taking the place of Ms. Dodd, who served as secretary. Um, so I'd like to welcome her and thank her for her service to our insurance committee. I'm going to let Mr. Davenport begin with Fund 264, and then I'll take 266. Um, on Fund 264 through February, revenue came in at $6.1 million. Um, expenditures came in um, about a million dollars less, $5.2 um, million dollars for the expenses, um, exactly $862,000 um, that was credited back into the fund when we're looking at a total year budget. On the second page, um, you will see the calendar year and the fiscal year. Uh, focusing on the calendar year for insurance purposes at the top, um, so far through the year, we have 12.2 million of total revenue versus 11.2 of total expenditures, um, totaling $957,000 um, to the positive uh, back to the fund for a surplus um, through two months. And of course, as always on page three, uh, we include the hard data from where these graphs are derived from and where they're calculated from, um, consistent with what you have seen in the past. Um, and you can see the same supporting data that I just referenced um, on this page. Okay, so you may want to take just a moment to see if you've got some questions here. He's, he studies this every, every day, 24 hours a day, so it's firsthand to him, but uh, he, Anyone have any questions or comments they want to make here? Two months he's reported, right? Yes, sir. Ms. Hickerson, is that all clear to you? I think what I heard, we, got a, we started off with a good positive direction for the first two months of this calendar year. Yes, sir, we're nearly at a million dollars running to the advantage of the plan, so we're doing very well. Okay. All right, so if there's no other questions, continue on there. We can go forward with Fund 266. Within Fund 266, ending in the month of February, we're at $519,109 compared to prior year of I'll be able to share more details about our expenses in the next report. If there are no questions, continue. Okay, so moving forward, we'll go with our uh, workers' comp OJI statistics, our OSHA report. Mr. Good is out in the field today, so I'll be covering his report. We did have some storm damage, as most of you are aware, at a couple of our schools and one of our fire departments. So we have actual travelers, uh, adjusters on site, and Mr. Good's accompanying them to all the locations today. Looking at our OSHA report, we had 19 um, claims during the month of February. We have 35 year to date with four lost days and other recordables totaling at five. Going to page two of the report, you'll see that we're up by $3,000 um, from 2016 to 2017, um, I'm sorry, up in numbers from 2016 to 2017 by a total of three. Our on-the-job injury incurred is uh, down 40,000 from 2016 when we were at 87,000 to current year of 47,000. And the remaining pages provide you with a breakdown um, by department and by a different division within the Board of Education, which had 11 claims um, for the past month. 
and Rutherford County, which had eight claims for the last month. Anyone have any questions or comments there? Okay, we can continue on. So you have gotten us through the workers' comp and OJI, and you're ready for wellness? Yes, sir, Mr. Puckett. Good afternoon. Quick uh, update on the wellness. Uh, MedPoint and Cigna, we wrapped up our um, Eat This, Not That presentation on March the 16th. We had 15 people in attendance. A lot of fun dissecting food labels and learning how to properly shop in a grocery store. Our Know Your Numbers campaign, um, from January 1 to present, we've had 233 biometric screenings done, as well as 103 um, online assessments. B keep in mind, too, for this month, we're also giving away three iPads if you completed it from January uh, through March. Next month will be four Yeti coolers. So if you don't want an iPad, but you may want a Yeti cooler, make sure you get that biometric screening done next month at uh, one of the MedPoint clinics. Um, a thing to note here is we've had 137 biometric screenings in the month of February. Um, year to date from last year was 129 versus year to date this year is 202. So it's a pretty good jump in three months, or excuse me, two months. So we're hoping to um, continue that moving forward. Hopefully our communication uh, methods have been effective. Speaking of, I recently sent out a, a magnet and a letter just introducing the wellness program to everyone in the county who's on the medical plan. Hopefully you got it. Hopefully you didn't throw it away. Hopefully it's up on your fridge. It has a, a list of all the stuff that we have going on uh, for the remainder of the year. Um, wellness coaching for February, we had three initial visits as well as 30 follow-up visits for a total of 33 visits uh, for the month of February. 46 active patients with 33 total visits. Um, current and upcoming events are uh, Walk Across America program will start uh, in April. What it is is it's a, a team of, you can get a team of four people and basically you can walk, run, swim, bike, rob the elliptical, whatever it is you do. And you're gonna send me, you and your team, your total distance each week. And the person who, the team who goes the furthest will each get a set of Power Beats wireless headphones. Those are little wireless headphones that go around your ear. They're like $200, so they work really well. I have a set myself. So just a little incentive to participate, challenge your, your, your coworkers and things like that. Um, the Life Services EAP uh, webinar this month is Disrupting Negative Thoughts, another good one. Um, that's available to the end of the month. Logging on, the username is Rutherford, um, and the password is employee. So that's all I have, unless you guys have any questions. Oh, and one last thing. Uh, we did finish our program, our quarter one program, uh, our weight loss program. We had one lady lose 11 pounds and 8% body fat, and another one, Miss Evelyn Anderson, who works in the risk management office. She lost eight pounds, but she had the most points, and she won an Apple Watch. So long story short, please join our programs because we give away cool stuff. So if you don't have any questions, that's it for me. And Thank no, you. it wasn't rigged. It's an equal, equal opportunity program. It was. It wasn't rigged. It wasn't. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Puckett. All right. Now, we're coming to a, a whole series of discussions here. And agenda item five is plan comp comparison. So you have this book in front of you. So Ms. Street has pointed out some pages that you're going to be referring to in some detail. Pages three through eight are going to be discussing and presenting information <coughs> plan comparison. Page nine is the plan recommendation. Ten, page 10 is trend analysis. And 12 through 17 is where you have the medical, 2018 medical rates for active and retiree people. So we'll start and uh, with this discussion, and I'm sure we'll bring on any number of questions and ideas about this. So, Ms. Street, start us with this discussion, please. You're familiar with Ms. Derrick from Willis Towers Watson. I asked them to do a comparison of our plan to the state of Tennessee plans. Inevitably, it comes up um, from the school board every year, and we do um, 
look at that information on an annual basis. Today I wanted to bring it to the committee um, so that you all would better understand how our plan looks compared to the state plan so she'll provide you with that comparison information. So if you'd like to take over, Ms. Derrick. Thank you, Ms. Street. So on page three, you'll see kind of an overview versus Rutherford County versus the state. For the Rutherford County plans, there are three current plans in place, and all three of the plans that are offered to the employees um, use the OAP, the full access network through Cigna. For the state of Tennessee, they use both Cigna and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, and they offer four plans for their local government and local education, three plans for their state and higher education um, employees. Um, of those four plans, they, they mirror similar to what you currently have in place here in Rutherford County, and we'll kind of get into that in the next pages. Um, but they offer a $500 deductible plan, a $1,000 deductible, and then they also have a high deductible CDHP plan, similar to what you have with the HRA today. The one thing that I want to point out on their plans is that all of their options are based on a limited network. So under Blue Cross Blue Shield, they offer it under their S network. Um, the P network is the much broader network in Tennessee. The S network is a much smaller, and it is minus the HCA hospitals. Um, the Cigna network is the local plus network and not the OAP. They do give the employees an option of purchasing up to the OAP, but they charge their employees an additional $40 for employee only and employee plus child, and an additional $80 for employee plus spouse and employee family um, per month if you want the full access OAP network. Their CDHP um, plan, their high deductible plan that they offer, has an HSA tied to it versus where the state or where Rutherford County does an HRA. So that's one difference. And then they also have their partnership Pro promise program, which is the wellness where you have to go out and do the HRA, the biometric screening, and also commit to doing a disease management or a case management program if you're called on by one of the two vendors, um, and then they would do a reduction in your premium of either $50 or $100 per month if you participate. Any questions on that? Mr. Sandvig. What, can you elaborate a bit more on the difference in the networks? Yeah, so the local plus network, and I may have Mr. Davenport help me with this one a little bit about the different hospitals and things that aren't included in that. Um, for Blue Cross Blue Shield, it does not include the um, the HCA hospitals. So you, you lose a huge portion of hospitals here in the Middle Tennessee area that you would have under the full program. And then for Cigna, which hospitals or doctors are not included? So for the Cigna piece, and speaking when I worked at Cigna living in Rutherford County, under their, Cigna calls their network that is equivalent to the states. They call it Local Plus. That would be the equivalent of the smaller network. Um, but uh, Middle Tennessee Medical Hospital on Memorial is not under that network. So that would present a huge issue being the number one hospital in the county is not included so that's why um, we're still on the full access plan with that for that to be included and i think the one thing to point out too is the rate differential between the state total premium rate and what the county total premium rate is they are um, very close together however our employees have a full access um, and the, the best network around that, whereas it's a more restrictive network at a same premium level under the state plan. And, and that is a key difference between our plan and the state plan is the access point. Any other questions? Okay. So we'll focus on pages four and five just to kind of give you a quick overview of the differences in the plans. Um, again, as I noted, that the local education and government plans offered by the state have four options. The actual state and higher education have three. They're the same three with the um, exclusion of the $2,000 um, CDHP, so very similar. So what you'll see the differences in these plans will be mirrored on the next page as well. But the first page, page four, are the current Rutherford County plans as they are today. And then on page five are those four options. So they have their partnership PPO plan, which is a $500 deductible, very similar to your deductible plan today. The difference between those is that there are actual office visit copays where your current deductible plan today is coinsurance for office visits. 
kids. Um, you will also notice that their generic copay on drugs is a little bit higher on the state plan than what yours is today as well. Under their standard PPO, this is their $1,000 deductible plan, which is very similar to your OAP copay plan that you all offer today. Um, the biggest difference there is that they have um, out-of-network copays, which is very unusual for most plans to see that, and their um, pharmacy benefit is considerably higher than what you all currently offer today. The limited PPO is a high deductible option, so it has a $1,600 deductible tied to it for the employees, um, but it does not have any sort of a reimbursement account or HSA or HRA tied to it. It does have office visit co-pays, and again, it has a bit higher of that RX. And then the local health savings CDHP, which would be most be the closest to what your HRA plan is today is a $2,000 deductible, um, the coinsurance plan, as you can see, and it very it it has a much lower actual coinsurance than what the HRA plan does today. Yes, ma'am. What do the asterisks mean? So, if you look at the um, states under the CDHP, the last one has 70%, then it has an asterisk. What does that stand for? That means that's the coinsurance after the deductible has been met. So similar to your HRA plan today, you would have to meet that $1,750 deductible, and then you would start paying the coinsurance. So you would have 10%. The plan would pay 90% until you hit the out-of-pocket expense. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions on the plans? If you'll flip over to page seven, the other thing that we were asked to look at was what the cost of individual coverage might look like for someone if they were to come off the Rutherford County plan um, and try to secure individual insurance in the marketplace for themselves and their family. So what we did was we pulled up the rate sheet that Cigna has for their plans that are actually on the marketplace. So um, the closest plan that was out there that was similar to the Rutherford County plans was a $1,500 deductible plan. Every Everything else was a higher deductible offering. Um, keep in mind that when you're calculating the family rates, you have to calculate it based on the age of everybody that you are enrolling on that plan. And you can also only enroll up to three dependents under the age of 21. So if you were to do any more, you would have to get a separate plan for anybody over and above that. Also, they do have smoker rates tied to this, so if any of the yourself or your dependents are smokers, use tobacco, there is a 25% surcharge added to the rates that they charge you under this. So when we were looking at the rates, we used uh, an average age of around a 40-year-old person. For an individual 40-year-old under that $1,500 deductible plan, the rates were $542 per month. If you add a spouse to that, and let's say your spouse is 45 years old, you would add your rate plus their rate to get $1,155 per month. And keep in mind, this is 100% cost paid by the employee. Employee plus children, a 40-year-old employee, let's say a 10 and a 7-year-old child, because all the rates under a certain age are the same, it would be $1,080 a month. And then for a family cost with a the dependents I mentioned above, you're looking at $1,693 per month. Okay. On page eight, this is the actual rate sheet that is tied to that if you wanted to kind of look at different ages and different ranks plus the other plans that are offered out under the marketplace that would be a lower cost option for the employees at a much higher deductible. And just to kind of summarize um, what, what Kelly was saying, you know, page seven and page eight, th the purpose of this exercise was to kind of see where you stacked up um, against what someone could get on an individual marketplace um, versus what you have today. So to kind of tie it back into your actual numbers, uh, as far as the renewal goes, this plan is most comparable to the HRA, like we mentioned. Uh, that current employee only rate is $440 compared to the 542 uh, for actually a little bit leaner benefits than you're actually getting today on that HRA plan. So this was kind of used to say where do we stack up against and as you can assume if we're that's 23% higher on that tier alone each tier uh, obviously that would go up uh, the same comparable amount from where those rates are set for each tier. So this is just kind of reassurance that uh, we are priced competitively in a good position compared to those marketplaces. Are 
Are there any other questions regarding the comparison or the individual marketplace options? So to summarize, because that was a lot of information for them to receive and absorb in a short time, what is the moral of the story here? What should they walk away understanding after seeing the information that you've provided? That the plans offered by Rutherford County are very comparable to what comparable or actually a little bit better than what are offered out there by the state plans along with the cost of the plans being here are actually very um, competitive with what's out in the in the marketplace as well thinking or do you understand all that completely I had some personal concerns about this and they have uh, certainly provided information to I guess you could say set aside most of my concerns that we were pricing ourselves out of the marketplace but we're not we're we're doing better okay continue on are we finished with that plan comparison yes sir and ready to move to plan recommendation Yes, sir. Page so, nine. All right. So on page nine is a recommendation we've brought forward to the committee today. Um, every year we also do an, an annual review of what uh, programs we are offering, what the benefit types are, and piggybacking on the state comparison and looking at um, the rates that we'll propose um, here shortly. Mr. Davenport did some various analysis that we looked at to, you know, what can we move inside of the plan to help offset some of the increases that we are looking at. And so um, the one that we are bringing to the table today is in regards to the HRA plan. And I'll have Mr. Davenport explain what is in front of you on page nine. So on page nine, uh, you can see three different columns, pretty straightforward information. Currently, 750 deductible, okay? Um, that's compared to individual and family. Individual, 1750, family, 3500. On the state plan that we just kind of saw and mentioned, um, the current deductible for them is $2,000, $4,000, 2000 individual, 4000 for family. Um, what the um, idea is here is to kind of mirror that plan uh, by doing that on the deductible, we would see right at a million dollars of projected savings. Where that calculation comes from is a 4% actuarial plan design value uh, that we calculate, and then that 4% is equated back to the total claim spend for the HRA plan. So this is a true saying, if we were to save 4.71% on this plan, it would equate to $1,084,000. Um, so that does one of two things. One, um, it allows us to not give the HRA plan as high of a percent increase increase year over year. Um, two, we could potentially realize these savings throughout the 2018 plan year. And then three, it also mirrors us um, with the state on that high deductible plan um, when we're looking for uh, Board of Education um, and the county general piece kind of matching up a little bit more to the state as the other two plans were right in line with what we saw. The other thing too is that it makes us remain competitive um, and the best part about looking inside of the plan for what you can modify is that majority of our people don't they don't spend through that ceiling so if we take a premium increase they're going to realize that effect every month when their premium deductions are pulled but they'll only see the impact of the $250 change on an individual basis $500 on a family unit basis if they go through the deductible amount. And so given, given the spend of our employees on an average basis and the fact that a lot of them roll over even the county contribution every year, um, it's best for them if we take a change inside of the plan versus pushing an additional 4% on them from a premium perspective. Ms. Hickerson. Okay, with this change, we're strictly doing a deductible, um, annual deductible, but we would not be changing the county contribution. It would still remain at 750 and 1500. That is correct. Other questions? So is this the only change we're actually looking at as far as yes, within the plan itself? Within any of the three within any of our three plans. Three this plans. is the only plan recommendation that we're making for, for 2018. And this decision be made independent of these 2018 medical rates. I mean, it's, 
Yes, sir. We need to make the decision regarding the plan. The premiums that are in front of you, um, we have we have considered that this would be a favorable option for for the em, uh, employees, and would most likely be received by the uh, insurance committee. And so, if we do not, then we can adjust the rates based on the additional four percent. Okay. All right. More discovery and discussion. The recommendation from the risk management department is to increase that deductible amount for the HRA plan. <laughs> Mr. Hafner. Just a question. Which plan is the cheapest to operate? If 100% if of the employees went on each of the plans, which one would we come out ahead on? The HRA plan is our cheapest operating plan. Um, and that's for that is from this, uh, the premium perspective, which is what you're asking. Our total claims per person, uh, per member per year, is lowest on that plan as well. Forty-four percent of all of our employees are on that plan, um, and I can tell you that nine out of ten times during open enrollment, when I sit down with employees, they're in the wrong plan, and I inevitably will move them to the HRA plan because it's a better value plan for them. Shouldn't we steer them towards that plan instead of steer them away from it? Most people that are in the plan, we don't feel will come out of the plan because they understand what their spend is. $250 is not going to derail an individual to move off of a plan when you look at an additional premium increase if they understand what their plan is, what their plan spend is. Um, what will derail them if, is if we take, right now we have a recommended increase of, we're at a 12% aggregate, we have, a, we have it broken out by plans as well. So right now the HRA would be at a 5%. What would derail them is if we come back and say we're taking a 9% increase. The people that I've talked to that don't go to that HRA plan do, don't go because of the medical, the prescription benefit. That's the one uh, problem they have with the plan. Is there any way to steer people that way by offering them a better prescription benefit plan on that HRA plan and try to push people in that direction to save money because it seems like we've gone up on the HRA plan at times to, to just prevent from having to go up on the other two plans, which are the ones that are really driving the, the cost. Yeah, so we didn't do that um, in 2017. We actually put the, put the increase where the plan was seeing the actual utilization to justify it. It was in the deductible plan. Um, there are people, and there always will be people, that the HRA plan for the pharmacy reason will not be the proper um, situation for them. I can tell you, though, that I have people that are on medications and people are fearful of it until they sit down and they actually go through the exercises because generic or generic utilization is so high. A lot of the medications that people are on are on generics and it will still be better off for them in the long run. If you combine the med point clinics with it as well, which is an option for our employees where they can get a lot of those generics at no cost if they're being treated for that condition at the clinic, then you know, it's a consumer-driven health plan. That's what an HRA is. And you have to be, have a higher level of accountability and understanding and directness in how you manage your care if you're going to be on that. But inevitably, work improving the benefit for a pharmacy is going to impact their premium. And we don't want to... We don't want to deter people off because the pharmacy piece is not an issue for the 44% that are on it today. Mr. Sandvig, were you wanting? How, as far as the costs incurred, how, how is it looking for the three different options before we proceed on this change to the HRA plan? So between the three plans, assuming I'm understanding what you're asking, so uh, the deductible plan is obviously driving the most of the cost, followed by the copay second, and the HRA plan is subsidizing um, the plan to the benefit right now. So which is very typical and what we would expect to see, the richest plan drives the most of the cost, the copay kind of drives the median, and then the HRA is uh, running well over the past, uh, what was about eight years, I believe, we look back at it. If, if the HRA is subsidizing, should we look at shifting the cost, more of the cost to the plans that are incurring the cost? So last year we actually did that. Um, I'll go ahead and direct you to um, page 14 of your book, and this will directly answer the question. We're at a 12% aggregate increase, uh, necessary increase overall on our plan. We don't feel that it's fair 
because you do get into that subsidization whenever you do the aggregated increase across all three plants, right? Last year, we took the same approach and we said, let's put the increase on the plan that's incurring the cost. And that's the recommendation we're gonna make to you today as well. When he says that they're subsidizing, what that means is the plan is running well and the premiums are helping to offset some of the other costs, right? Um, even with that, however, we need a 5% increase on the HRA plan when you look at an actual basis and projecting what future claims are going to do. You have to remember inside of our claim, inside of our premium projections is medical trend and pharmacy trend. Our medical trend annually will run 8 to 10%. Pharmacy will run somewhere between 12 to 15%. So even when a plan is running well, you can still expect an increase because you have to look at that medical trend for the upcoming year. So um, the, what we will be recommending later is the copay needs a 9%, where the deductible needs a 20%, and the HRA plan needs a 5%. One of the other variables on the copay and deductible plan is the blended rates. Our pre-65s are killing us. Their utilization is extremely high. Their cost incurred on a claims basis is astronomical. If they were standalone and we wanted to price them standalone, they would need well in excess of 100% increase. So our active employees are paying higher premiums for our small pre-65 population. So you're comfortable that with this proposal and what we did last year, we, we are, and yeah, if you put the two years together for the deductible, it's a hefty 40%, increase. 40%, yeah, because it, it was high last year. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, other discussion? We're still on this one recommendation with respect to the HRA plan on uh, increasing that deductible, 250 individually and 500 for the family. So what's the wishes of the committee? Ms. Hickerson? There's no more discussion. I'll go ahead and make the motion to, let's go ahead and make this change on the annual deductible for the HRA to 2,000 and 4,000 based on the ultimate savings of not having to hit them for an extra 4% on their premium increase um, for them across the board on the HRA plan. And, uh, uh, and I see it very feasible. And let's make a note that the county contributions to remain at the same. All right, that's a motion. Do we have a second, Ms. Allen? And the back row, I think, all hands up almost. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Now. Any more discussion or questions regarding this change to the HRA plan? A motion we do have to increase these uh, annual deductibles with the other language that she's added there to uh, clarify this situation. Mr. Marlin. So just make sure I understand if we don't do this, then the HRA would go up 10% on some of these other, when we get into that discussion? Okay. All right, any more discussion? All in favor of that then, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, that was unanimous, I'll call it that. <laughs> okay, let's continue on to trend analysis. Okay, so on page number 10, um, what I put together um, called a historical trend analysis. <clears throat> so what this does is looking back over the past seven years um, on a per employee per month basis of the county spend. Um, so three different things I kind of want to lay out and then we'll kind of discuss what this tells us and, and what we did this report for. The green line that you can see at the top is based on um, national trend. So this is where um, after each year is over and completed, um, carriers will come through and say, this is the actual trend that we were able to hold healthcare cost at this year, uh, be it 8%, 9%, 10%, whatever that trend is. So that number year over year reflects the actual trend that everybody in the marketplace of healthcare as a whole um, is experiencing onto their plan. The bottom line that is purple is actually where uh, Rutherford County ran each of those years as well. Um, 
let me explain this first, and then I'll kind of explain what that yellow line in the middle means. So what, what we derived from this report, what, what the point of doing this was, um, was to see how the cost stacks up against basically everyone else. How did you compare on a trend basis year over year as far as controlling your cost compared to the national trend? So you can see over the past seven years, um, not one time was Rutherford County on an increase compared to the national trend. Um, I preface that to say seven years is as many I could put into this graph without all the numbers being so small that no one would be able to read them. Um, I also looked back to about 2008 and from 2008, uh, 2009, 2010, um, you also did not breach those either. So when we're looking back um, over the past uh, eight, nine, ten years, um, Rutherford County has not breached that national trend level um, once. Um, a couple of things that are going to factor into that. Um, if you point to 2010, um, and you can't see the purple line on 2010 because the yellow and the purple are the same amount. I'll explain that, like I said, shortly, so just bear with me. Um, 2010, using that as a starting reference on this um, historical graph, uh, what we look to do is kind of see what changes were made, what happened in those years. So each year uh, when Miss Street would rec recommend a uh, plan change, Change, like we just did for the HRA plan um, the following year 2011 or in 2011 the following year of 2012 you can see the benefit to the plan for the county um, on that you actually even ran better or the same as the year before so think of it as a sense of if you are supposed to increase 9% every year but you stay the same then you just buck trend and won by 9% for that year so that's kind of what on our side we do this report and look for on here the yellow line, what this is, is, is it represents in 2010 had no plan changes, um, no, no different ways that we actually control the trend been done. If everything had remained the same, that would be the trajectory of the claims for the county. So you can see if we kept the same percent spread in 2010 and did not make any plan changes and just kind of let it ride, let everything stay the same, um, you can see each year how much higher the cost would have been realized uh, for the county on this graph. So one, one of two things that it told me, um, one, uh, county is in a good spot. Even if you look over the last three years, how we are seeing somewhat of an increase, you're still well below what we're seeing everybody else increase at, being that healthcare is the fastest growing um, market in the United States of America. Um, two, the plan changes that you have made for each year um, have seen a positive result. I mean, each year uh, we are controlling that cost and there's not a year that you have grown past that trend amount. Now, I know I've said a lot, explained a lot. Uh, I hope I've explained it simply enough without to confuse you. Um, but as you're kind of looking through those numbers, uh, any questions, concerns, anything I, I didn't explain well enough that you're uh, not sure about? So in, so make sure that I'm looking at this correctly. So if I take the green line in, in 2016, we're at $11,099 um, for national, and Rutherford County came in at $992. I took the difference between those two numbers, multiplied it times 5,000. That would have meant an additional $1,035,000 inside of our plan that we would have spent if we would have ran at National Trend. And you can see that in other years, that gap is much wider. So to make it tangible and you know, applicable specifically to us in a dollar, you know, just by doing some of the things that we've done in one year alone, we saved the plan over a million dollars that we would have spent otherwise. Well, and a, probably a more simplistic view. Whatever we did between 2011 and 12, we really made a major change there. And what we did between 2013 and 14, we held even. Those two years there and those changes that were made put us down at a point that so, uh, allowed us to create a differential between this yellow line that we even have grown at least as fast percentage-wise the last two years as, as the yellow line grew, but we had done some things important enough back there that gave us a foundation to still have a spread. So when I came in 2010, the 2011 program was already in place, rates had been decided on and so forth. 
beginning um, in 2011, the recommendation was made to the committee that we move the $250, we had a $250 deductible plan, which was unheard of in the marketplace. That's when we moved um, to the $500 deductible plan. Over the course of the other years, you see there, we made a lot of co-insurance changes inside of the plan, um, cost-sharing changes inside of the plan. We introduced the copay plan. And so this is a good visual aid for you all to see what those individuals' decision did on a much grander scheme. And Ms. Street, when did we start at Mr. McAdoo's recommendations moving that 90% uh, down toward 80%? What year did we start that? So we are currently at, I can tell you real quick. It drops to 83 this year, right? So we would have, yeah, it was 84 and we had started at 90. So it'd be six. So that's, that's a material factor in our Absolutely. ability to stay below. Right, that's one of the, that would be under the umbrella of cost sharing. Okay, any more discussion on the trend analysis? Um, Mr. Sandvig. I, I was playing, I've been playing with graphs and, and that, analyzing things. When we compound that 1% shift to the employee with the rate increases we've seen, our employees, even though the county government and the Board of Ed have picked up the, the vast majority and will continue to, our employees have seen stiff rate increases too when you put the two together. Yeah, it's added from an employee perspective. If you look at just what theirs is, you know, a 9% could jump as high as a 13 to them just by that 1% contribution change. So it may be 9% to the total premium, but when you split out the premiums, it adds additional percentage increase to them. That's Mr. Sandvig's point. Questions? Sort of one takeaway, in my view, if you look at all of this and look at the total cost that businesses and government are having to share, you might say, or fund for health care, I don't see how in the world small business can sustain this kind of growth. It's, it's a major systemic problem in this whole country. So they're up there in Washington talking about this right now, but it's, I don't know how anybody's going to fund it. Okay, I don't want to, that's a bit of a pessimist, pessimist <laughs> but it's, uh, it's reality. Okay, let's go on then to medical rates, 2018. Okay, so for the rates, we're going to be on pages, um, 12 through uh, 17. So I'm going to start with uh, medical, then go to dental, and then go to vision. And just the county general. Mm -hmm. um, so on page number 12, we have 12 and uh, 13. I'll kind of explain this as we go. And of course, stop me if you have any questions. I want to make sure everybody's uh, kind of wrapping their head around this. Um, so we have similar to last year, we, we provide two options. Um, the first option um, is what I call an aggregate increase, meaning that um, everybody on every plan gets the same increase. Okay. And then what I call an experience increase and kind of what uh, Ms. Street referenced a few minutes ago where we're basically giving the increase to each plan for what they deserve based on how they ran throughout the year. Okay. So just to remind you, last year uh, we went with the experience increase, which was our option two last year, um, for the for the deductible plan, I believe it was 13.8 and then um, nine on the copay and um, three or four on the HRA plan, if my memory serves me right. I believe that's close. So we're kind of giving you the same options this year. Um, so to kind of preface this, on page number 12, uh, just a reminder, we break it out county general and then page number 13 being the Board of Education. Um, the reason we do that, as a reminder, county general is on a 12-month premium schedule, uh, meaning if they needed $120 a month, they're going to divide that out by 12 to get a $10 monthly cost. On the Board of Education, being that the, uh, the teachers have the summer for the two months, we do it on a 10-month schedule. So we break those out because the way that the rates are compounded 
um, they look a little bit differently. The total sums the same at the end of the year, but the way that we have to break it out for the teachers on the Board of Ed and the County General, we split those out as we have the past several years. So on the option one, um, the recommendation is a 12% increase with a 1% reduction in contributions, um, similar to what we were kind of mentioning that uh, we have been doing the last uh, six years. Um, we would be going from 84% down to 83% this year, and that is only for the copay and deductible plans. That excludes the HRA plan. Um, so you can see for option one, um, page number 12 for the county general 12 month uh, premium schedule, the recommendation for option one on an aggregate increase is 12% and a 1% reduction to the um, contributions for employee spouse, employee child and family on the copay and deductible plan. Also on page 13 is the same information, just the 10 month rates, mind you, with the Board of Education. Um, so a 12% increase. And if you will kind of look through here as you're looking through the numbers, you'll see the total monthly cost, um, but you can see the monthly increases um, kind of in the middle um, for the employer um, and also for the employee. Are there any questions so far? I just want to make sure that I'm following this correct. Sure. It's a 12% increase. The 1% reduction is actually a 1% increase as well. To the so for the employee, um, yes. Without getting right. deep into the mathematics, it's in the county's proportion. So it's a 1% increase to the employee. So it's a 13% or is it 12% combined? That to make it that's a that's a difficult answer. Um, well, it's not a difficult answer. It's just difficult to explain. So it's a percentage of a percentage. So if you have a hundred dollars and someone is paying twenty dollars and you decrease that by a percent, that percent realized is actually three to four percent. Once you look at the actual breakdown of the algorithm, uh, where the county is paying eighty percent of that cost, so that percent is not hit as hard because it's more risk that's being subsidized within that eighty percent. So in an easier way, if you have a twelve percent gap. Here, here um, for the um, county and then you drop that by 1% for the employees, the gap gets a little bit bigger. So by a per actual percentage rate, um, I can calculate that out for you here if you give me just a quick. Okay, thank you so much. She's reading my mind over here today. That's all right, I got you. So if we just do the... Uh So the total percentage comes out to 14.2% for the employee. Is Hickerson. I kind of jumped ahead a little bit. Um, on, on looking at this, in, in my mind, many years ago when Mr. McAdoo said, let's get it down and just guarantee every year we're going to take a 1% reduction. I think we kind of set a precedent last year when we went to the um, um, share contribution percentage, I may have not said that right, but in my opinion in looking ahead, I think we should take option one totally off the table because option one, option two helps everybody except for the deductible plan. And I can say this because I'm on the deductible plan, so if I vote for this, I'm voting to hurt myself, if you will. But I'm also paying for what I call the Cadillac version of the insurance that the county offers. So I don't know if it's appropriate at this time or whatever to just skip the option one discussion and let's look at option two 
and because it makes it more feasible for the county because it helps everybody else because it's less premium increase except for the deductible folks and those folks are there for a specific reason now by less okay. premium increase you're saying the percentage to the participants in the plan is less than 12 percent on an aggregated basis however it's still we're going to get to the same budget needs that we have it's just how do we slice the pie and you're saying it's more equitable on option two because those who are basically eating more of the pie are paying more of the premium right exactly i mean i'm i'm strictly a number person if i was a copay employee only on option one i'm gonna pay 66 dollars or 65.99 but on the option two where i get the it kind of shares of who you, you pay for what you get. The county employee for a copay only is 64.22. That's bound near two dollars difference. I mean that's two dollars, but that's two dollars. And over over a, uh, a year's time, that adds up. And I hate to see us to get away from the precedents. You know, we've stuck with what Mr. McAdoo has said. Let's take a percent off. Well, let's don't start backsliding and making everybody pay because we've helped our trend line stay a certain gap and I and I think we need to do the same I you know like I said I don't know if it's appropriate or not right now to say take option one off let's look at two strictly because it feasibly helps everybody but the deductible folks and like I said most of us are there for a specific reason on the deductible plan and even on option two, we're still doing the 1% contribution reduction on the deductible plan and the copay plan. And, and I want to point that out for two reasons. One, to make sure it's clear. It also speaks to Mr. Hafner's point earlier about let's not disincentivize employees to not take the HRA. And so a few years ago, when we got to appropriate contribution levels on the HRA, we actually stopped that reduction process so that we didn't disincentivize them. So they do get the higher county contribution, uh, which is helps keeps their premiums much lower on the HRA. All you've said, Mrs. Hickerson, is, is appropriate, but we can't take any action until we get a motion from somebody. Ms. Uh, Oh, you're not ready for a motion, but you want, we'll, we'll take your comment though. Okay. Uh, you, you said 44% were currently enrolled in the HRA plan. How many in the deductible and the copay? Can you give me those figures as well? Yeah, close. The next, I no, I, I can't tell you specifically. I can tell you that the next highest participation is in the copay plan and then the deductible plan. I can tell you that. It, Here's some numbers on these papers you got. It older, looks like about, that, yeah. about the same number of people in the uh, yeah. other two plans, it looks like to me. Mr. Sandvig. I'll make a motion to proceed to option, in the discussion on option two. So you moved that we accept option two? To move the discussion on to option we'll Just move two. to the discussion? Yes. Okay, well. We don't need a motion to do that. We, we, we can just say, okay, and there's someone has something to say about option one, we'll go on to option two. All right, so we'll move to option two, Mr. Sandvig. Okay, while he's calculating that, I'll go ahead and start. So under option two, beginning on page 14, um, you will see that we will achieve the budgetary needs of the insurance fund, which is a 12% aggregated increase across the board. However, we have looked at claims utilization within each of the three options. And in doing that, see that there is a necessary increase of 9% on the copay plan, 20% on the deductible plan, and 5% on the HRA plan, and the premium uh, breakdown that you will see with the total, um, the employee and employer total monthly increases reflects both of those uh, necessary increases as well as a 1% decrease in contribution from the county towards premiums. So on the um, copay plan, an individual would see $5.30 as an example. Those um, in the family plan would see a $43.23 monthly increase. On the deductible plan, an individual would see $14.82 a month. On the employee plus family, they would see $94.55 a month. And then on the HRA plan, it's 100% paid for employee only. And an employee plus family would see $3.65. Um, on the copay plan, 
the highest, um, so Mr. Davenport is showing that we have 30% participation on the copay plan and 25% on the deductible plan. Um, on the copay plan, our um, enrollment, our highest enrollment category is employee only. So the impact, the majority of those inside the, the uh, copay plan would be $5.30 a month. The next highest category is employee plus children, which would be the $27.58 a month. Moving on to the deductible plan, the highest participation category is employee only. So they would see $14.82 a month. And the second highest category participation is employee plus children at $60.32 a month. Employee only is our highest participation category in the um, HRA plan, and employee plus children is the second highest participation category. Family coverage is within the plan, just to give you an idea. Um, and this is only uh, county general numbers that I'm looking, I can tell you. It's consistent, the it's consistent on the percentages is what I'm being told, and I can see that here. Um, in our, within our family units, however, is what I was looking at, because that's where they see the biggest increases. We have 63 family units on the copay in the county. We have 246 on the copay within the Board of Education. Um, we have 46 family units on the deductible plan within the county, 121 within the Board of Education. And then we have 81 family units in the HRA on the county and 331 family units with on, on the Board of Education. Okay, well, it answers those questions and we're still in discovery on option two. I guess I'll go ahead and make a motion to accept these rate increases based on what is presented for the option to um, break down for Rutherford County General and Board of Education. And Mr. Sandvig? Ms. Hickerson, I'd like to bring something else up. I mean, are you going to second that first? Well, I, no, I was not going to second. Okay, well, I can't, I got to have a second. Ms. Allen, now Mr. Sandvig. Okay. Are we at the time to look at ending the deductible plan? We are there. Um, we postponed it for a year. It will be uh, reviewed and brought to the committee next year as long as it's a proper recommendation to make, but we certainly are at a point where we need to blend these two plans. We wanted to give employees an opportunity to make that decision ind individually or look at specific marketing towards those in continue, who continue to make that election. Um, I can already tell you within the last month I have spoken to a couple of people who are on the deductible plan who I've sat down with and shown them where they're in the wrong plan. So we will do some targeted marketing to try to get them to move individually. But yes, I would not be surprised if next year if the recommendation isn't made to remove that plan. Okay, so we've got a motion and a second to uh, adopt the recommendation for option two. Ms. Stevenson. I'm sorry, I know I ask these crazy questions, but if, and I don't, I'm sure there's a reason why we did it, so I'm just curious, but on the HRA plan, if our utilization is the highest on the employee only and the employee plus child, and the focus is that if a spouse has their own insurance, those type things, have we considered in order, have we considered moving the contribution amount from employee plus family to 96 and moving the 94 to the employee plus child? Would that impact? Do you see what I'm talking about? I know that may be a crazy. I, I do. I see what you're asking. Um, the only point I would make back is um, that I, I would not focus on the percentages of the contributions because they're a percentage of the total rate and the total rate being higher for the spouses. Um, they're still coming out in an, what we feel is an adequate amount for the contribution, if that makes sense. Okay, more discussion? All of you then in favor of adopting option two, please say aye. Any opposed? 
Okay, thank you very much. Now, <coughs> let's talk about dental rates. Page 19. Sir, we need to... We need what? To continue on. Oh, did I miss something? Retirees, excuse me. <laughs> All right, so we're going to have the same discussion with respect to retirees on. Well, how would you like to proceed, Mayor? Because the, the pre 65s follow the active rates. So technically, when we voted on option two, that, that impacts both actives and pre 65 retirees. So I just want to make that clarification. But we do need to vote on the post 65s. Or we can take another vote, whatever you now, feel is best. Those pages are labeled pre-65 retirees. Yes, that's right. So, pre at the top. right. So if you look at 16, we've got as part of that, we have the pre on the option one. And then on the option two, we do show the 9% copay, 20% deductible, but the 12% aggregate in both scenarios on the post-65. So the post-65 needs a separate vote. So the same principles apply here that we've had in this previous discussion. So for the pre-65s, the same principle applies because they are mirroring the premiums for the actives. So option two would bring them the 9% and the 20% deductible because there's only one plan on the post-65s and the aggregated increase is needed at 12%, then the recommendation is made for post-65s that we adopt the 12% increase for 2018 rates. Nine percent copay and twenty percent deductible on the pre sixty fives and the post sixty fives is a twelve percent. Yes, sir. So motion to approve from Commissioner <coughs> Allen. Second. All right, we let Mr. Sandvig do that, Ms. Hickerson. <laughs> All right. Other discussion. Mr. Hey, history on the I don't remember on the grandfathered and the non grandfathered, who are they and what was that? Right, so the grandfathered and the non-grandfathered ties directly to um, what we call GASB, which is when we made changes to our um, other post-employment benefits, and we looked, gosh, when I don't know when you all started this, 2007. It was a three-year process. Uh, we wrapped it up in two, at the end of 2010, and that is when we did an actuarial analysis of what our spend rate was inside of our just our retiree population, and we trended that forward to see what the impact would be continuing medical coverage for retirees into a, an infinite period of time. And upon review, recommendations were made in terms of the eligibility factors and um, as well as what benefits that they would get. So grandfathered are those who receive a higher county contribution to their retirement premium. They also get pharmacy benefits at retirement. The non-grandfathered have a lower county contribution and will have uh, no pharmacy at some point in some instances. Okay, other questions? So we've got a motion before us to accept for the pre-65 retirees the 9% uh, on the copay and 20% on deductible and also included for those post-65 participants a 12% increase. Any more discussion? All of you in favor of that then please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you very much. Now we're ready for a dental discussion on page 19. <coughs> Um, so on page 19, we have stayed consistent on the dental piece, just like we did in medical, uh, by providing uh, two options. Option one uh, is on page 19 and would be a 6% increase to all plans. On page 20 would be the experience rated. It would be no increase to the option one, uh, a 5% increase to the option one buy-up, and a 2% increase to option two. And once again, just like medical, that is based on where the claim dollars were allocated between each plan, and that is also consistent with um, how we priced the dental plans out last year. The buy-up plan is running hot. It's continued to run hot. It's another plan that we're going to have to look at if we'll be able to continue offering that going forward um, to new enrollees. And so the recommendation of the uh, risk management department is to take dental option two because it is experience rated. So the recommendation is to take option two 
out of the three uh, options within the dental program. Take the increase of options. Take the increase for the options, uh, yeah. All right, what's the wishes or what's the questions of the Mr. Sandvig? You make a motion to approve. Second. Second, Ms. Allen. Further discussion? Okay, everyone in favor then, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Vision rates on page 22. Yes, sir. So on page 22, um, probably the easiest conversation we'll have all day. Um, I'm not proposing any increase on the vision plan. Uh, it ran uh, to budget as expected, um, and I don't feel like it uh, um, needs um, a bump in the actual rates. So I'm just proposing um, no increase to each rates and to hold flat for 2018. That's an easy one. Somebody wants to make that recommendation. Dickerson, is on it. <laughs> Dickerson motion to move. Second. Mr. McAdoo, we need to let you in on this deal. <laughs> it's not surprising. Mr. McAdoo likes to not take those rate increases. He jumped on that, didn't he? All right. If there's no other discussion, all in favor of that, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mrs. Street and Mr. Davenport. And let's see. And Mrs. Who is our other lady here? I don't have her name down here. <laughs> Ms. Derrick. Uh, they did a great job with this little booklet here and summarizing and presenting this information in a very readable and understandable way. So any other comments, Mr. Say? McAdoo? Uh, just uh, got a couple of comments. Uh, first, I see Lisa here today, so I'm gonna ask about Gatsby 45. I thought we were going to start including that on our report. Uh, so we can Gatsby 45? He's asking about the OPEB, he, and I'll take responsibility for that. You mentioned it last meeting. Time flies when you're having fun. I forgot to get with Ms. Nolan to get what the number is. We'll make sure to get it on next month's report. Okay. And, number, and my second suggestion is that we have a booklet like this where we set our budget for each commissioner so they can go over it and we can avoid insurance questions and not being able to answer them during the budget process. Okay. All right. They'll all, um, of course, they'll all see that budget, but we can put one of these booklets in, in Each all. Each one box. Yeah. Okay. We just do that before the budget meeting, and they'll at least have it then, and then they'll have it to. We'll do. We have them already today. We can put them in the put boxes. Them in today. Sounds good. Right. We also welcome feedback from the insurance committee. If you all see different ways of presenting the information, things that you like, um, let us know. I know that we've been requested before to get information out prior to the meetings. I can tell you that it is uh, difficult to do that because it's complex and we want to massage the information as long as we can. And especially during this time of year, we're in extremely tight time frames that we're working in. So anything other than that, we'd love to hear suggestions on. So if there's something, thank you. I do have one suggestion for people who aren't in this meeting and don't have the benefit of asking you questions and hearing some of the supplemental comments. I think it would be helpful for you to even include just a summary sheet of what your recommendations are and why, and that'll let them go directly to those pages. Okay. Sounds good. The other discussion or business that you wish to bring forward. If not, we are adjourned. Thank you.